Well, good morning. Uh, it is great to be with you all. I am Brandon Hall, uh, currently serving as one of the elders here at Anchor Point, and it is my privilege uh, to share with you uh, today's message. Uh, in case we have not yet met, I'd like to just share a little bit about myself. Uh, my wife, Katie, and I have four daughters, Maddie, who's soon to be 15, uh, Nora, 13, Elise, 11, and Emma, 8. Uh, as you no doubt can imagine, uh, as a dad of four girls, I've heard many comments, perhaps all of the comments over the years about having all girls or living in a house with all females, which also happens to include the, do the dog, Paisley. Uh, and that input even comes from within my own household at times, exemplified perhaps best by a t-shirt my daughters recently gave me, which says on it, dad of girls, hashtag outnumbered. But all joking aside, it is honestly a very special and unique privilege uh, to be the dad uh, four girls, and uh, something that I would obviously not exchange uh, for anything. Uh, from time to time, uh, I am asked why I think I ended up uh, with all girls. And those of you that know me uh, have probably heard me say that I attribute it to the fact that Katie and I could never agree on a boy name, like never, not a single one. And God just wasn't going to let there be an unnamed child. Uh, but really, uh, truly, the, the real answer is, um, and some of you have heard me say this before too, it's that uh, I just think God firmly believes that the world is desperately in need of more women like my wife uh, than men like me. And for any of you that know me and my wife, uh, you will know that to be true. I've never heard anybody argue that point. And if you don't not yet uh, know uh, either of us, uh, I encourage you to get to know her and you will soon have no doubt in your mind. Uh, of all the choices in my life, there were just two that were unmistakably correct. All the rest you could probably question. Uh, but that was to give my life to Christ, number one, and number two, uh, to pursue Katie and ask her to marry me. If uh, I were to add a third choice, it would probably be a toss-up between joining the Navigators uh, in college or joining Anchor Point after college. Uh, the short version of how we ended up at Anchor Point uh, was that we were returning to Duluth after serving on staff for a short stint with the Navigators at North Dakota State University in Fargo. And coming back to Duluth, we brought our first home in Chester Park, and uh, we were expecting our first child, Maddie, at that time. And this marked a really key transition in our lives from you know, being in a collegiate world to you know, now transitioning to a truly post-collegiate life. Now, if you know anything about the Navigators, there's a good chance that you know they are well known, perhaps best known for their value of discipleship and multiplication. So upon returning to Duluth, when a good friend of ours told us about this church in Anchor Point that was just getting started, that had a vision to multiply, we did not hesitate to check it out. Our first visit was in 2007, about a year after Anchor Point had started. And at that time, they had just moved out to their second location on Strand Road, which would become uh, the second of their four locations in four years. So a lot of moving uh, for Anchor Point in those early years. But sure enough, on that first Sunday, uh, we show up, and uh, here was founding pastor Jeff Sorbick preaching a, mes or a message about multiplying churches. I remember turning to look at Katie in that moment, each of us with an assured smile on our face, and we knew exactly in that moment that this was right where God wanted us to be, right where we needed to be. And fast forward, four children, 15 years later, and here we are, uh, proud to be a continued part of that vision, uh, and by God's grace, Anchor Point is still multiplying. It hasn't always looked like we thought it would. It's come with its unforeseen obstacles, difficult challenges, and even some losses. But even so, uh, the body of Anchor Point, its great commission-inspired vision uh, to be multiplying has endured, and it's one of Katie and I's great honors and privileges uh, to serve alongside all of you uh, throughout this journey, and we are continue to be excited about where God is taking it and, um, and where he's taking it now. And speaking of which, I want to take a moment as an elder to acknowledge this unique season that we're in, a unique season of change. Uh, as you've heard Pastor Josh mention, uh, this season we're kind of terming as a need or a season of uh, establishing um, and organizing. 
uh, in particular, just trying to get each of these multiple locations that God has multiplied us into better established. As Josh has stressed, uh, this especially means no new locations for now. One implication of that statement uh, that some of you may be wondering about is particularly that last part, um, you know, for now, which implies that there is this time to multiply to come again. And of course, in the interest of reaching our region with the gospel, we do in fact hope for that. However, we are open to a variety of ways in which God may lead that to unfold. Uh, one thing we're rather certain it won't look like is scaling the current approach of adding campuses, um, five, six, seven, or eight, um, continually underneath the umbrella of Anchor Point. We do not think it will look like that. Uh, it's not our hope to establish the next mega church of Duluth or some new denomination or even a rendition of the Catholic Church where Josh is installed as Pope. No. Uh, rather, we hope that having grafted these new campuses onto the shoot of Anchor Point, that will help them grow to become healthy enough that we can transplant them as independent, autonomous churches of their own. And that in so doing, or as we do that, we free up capacity here within the umbrella of Anchor Point to then, you know, lift our eyes again out to the horizon and look for another place to multiply out to in our community. And then, Lord willing, this other church, standing on its own two feet, would look to do the same. And in so, uh, we would create a movement of multiplying groups of churches. It's our hope that that vision reconcile or resonate with you uh, as much as it does us. And then for myself, there's great ties uh, to the early church in the book of Acts when I think about this, this vision of these multiplying churches that really excites me. Uh, this new season uh, has also ushered in uh, its share of both expected and unexpected changes. Uh, the elders uh, would like you to know um, that despite the fact that uh, we know we're supposed to be open uh, to change, we're supposed to embrace change, that it's not always easy. And we want you to know that that is not at all lost on any of us. We are very, very grateful uh, for all of you that have faithfully persevered, served, prayed, along with us through this current season. And in addition, we're really grateful for all of the solicited and even the unsolicited uh, input uh, from the many members of Anchor Point. Uh, reason being that I'm a firm believer that none of us, any one individual of us, are as smart as all of us. And I think that same sentiment applies to the elders. The elders as a group are not as smart as the entirety of the body of Anchor Point because of all the unique gifts that God has given to each and every one of you. It is necessary that we have those and the inputs that go along with them in order for us to uh, lead forward as a healthy body. So we're grateful for each and every one of your perspe perspectives um, in this journey. You know, eldership is this uh, ironically beautiful burden of honor, you know, a task that one must endeavor to do well, but is also certain to do imperfectly. And I will be the first amongst us to admit that I can own that, uh, my own shortcomings. But thank you to all of you for laboring with us and manifesting the reality of the truth that we see Paul espousing in his first letter to the Corinthians, where he encourages all to function as one body of many members. So thank you all for each playing your part. All right. With that, we're going to dig into God's Word. And as we do, uh, would you join me in praying? God, we, we look to you. You are the one our hearts adore. And we long uh, only to hear from you uh, this morning and every morning. The one whom all goodness, all righteousness, and all hopefulness abounds. Lord, I confess that in, in all honesty, I in many ways, much prefer my typical arrangement as student as opposed to preacher, as I find my gifts 
for public speaking sometimes wanting. But thanks be to you who has all we lack, all I lack, in great abundance with unmatched willingness to supply it. So, Lord, according, according with your will, please do so now. May the words that I bring forth today be only of you and any that are not fall on deaf ears. Lord, help me, help us to hear you, to see clearly your will for us today in response to your word and grant us the courage to rise to meet it. Amen. All right. If you would please turn to your Bibles and if you need one, uh, there should be some provided in the seats with you, and it is our encouragement that if you do not own one, to take one of those as your gift uh, from us to you. We desire that every person have a copy of God's Word. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our series in Matthew 13, in which Jesus has been taking us through a number of parables, and today we look at the last two of those parables in chapter 13, titled The Net and The New and Old Treasures. So we're going to read uh, each of these parables separately. We're going to spend the bulk of our time probably on uh, the former, the parable of the net, uh, before concluding briefly this morning on new and old treasures. So starting with Matthew 13, verse 47. This is Jesus speaking here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full... Men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus continues with the new and old treasures parable. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasures what is new and what is old. Now, if the sequence of these two parables leaves us with a degree of confusion, I suspect that we will find ourselves in quite the same company as the disciples, as we'll get to at the end of today's message. Uh, this first parable is a natural continuation of the journey that Jesus has had the disciples on, and uh, expanding our understanding of the kingdom of heaven. Each of them designed uh, to highlight various aspects of the kingdom of heaven coming at it from different perspectives. The f uh, then suddenly, after this parable about the net, Jesus switches to this parable about the new and, and old treasures, and Jesus does what seems um, he's often prone to do in the, with his students. Just as they are attaining a sense of clarity and understanding, He seems to give them a further profound truth that just so happens to require ample reflection and contemplation. And so that's what we want to do this morning. We want to reflect and contemplate. We're going to dig in and try to discover what the Holy Spirit has in store for us in these two parables. Jumping in with verse 47, Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. The use of the word again here, of course, makes sense. As we've mentioned, Jesus has been leading us through a handful of parables designed to teach us about the kingdom of heaven, each from a different perspective. In this particular instance, Jesus draws on the intimately familiar subject of fishing. It's intimately familiar for twofold reason here. Number one, the disciples we know, many of, of them were fishermen. And likewise, it is no doubt familiar to many of us by the nature of being Minnesotans. Now, of course, here, Jesus says the kingdom, when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea, he's not referring to the type of net that we would typically find in a regular Minnesotan boat designed to bring in the lunker at the end of a line. Nor is he referring to the type of commercial fishing net that one might find buoyed out in Lake Superior. Rather, the particular type of net that Jesus has in mind here, which relates to the disciples' experience and is noted by other translations, is a drag net. There are historically a couple common types 
of dragnets, and then many more modern varieties of them. But the one thing that stands as common amongst all dragnets is that they are an active form of fishing. Consider how this differs with a commercial gill net suspended along the north shore of Lake Superior, which passively catches only those fish which happen upon it. By contrast, the dragnet is deployed with active intention, encircling all target fish within its path. Up to this point, I imagine that the disciples are rather appreciating and resonating with Jesus' appeal to their area of expertise. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was thrown into the, into the sea. So far, so good. Thanks, Jesus. Appreciate that. But then he adds this phrase, quote, gathering fish of every kind. Now, there is not sufficient context here, but I would really love to know just how little or how much the disciples keyed in on this phrase, quote, of every kind. Reason being, I'm all but certain it would become increasingly apparent to them in the years that followed why Jesus stressed this point as the gospel spread from the Jews to the Gentiles. But at a minimum, I suspect here, it at least catches the disciples somewhat by surprise, because typically, a net is not designed for all kinds of fish, but rather for for kinds of a particular size or species. In their world, the disciples no doubt knew that a net that can catch fish of all kinds would probably be very difficult to make, likely expensive, and net you many undesirable or unprofitable fish. But in the kingdom of heaven that is like a net, Jesus shows us that complexity and expense are no matter. And moreover, that every kind is desirable and profitable. On verse 48, uh, Jesus says, When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Like all nets, we see here that this net is deployed for a time. And then, after that time has come, it's retrieved. When will this net be retrieved? No one knows. Later in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, Speaking about the end of the age, Jesus tells us, quote, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And just as in life, as Isaac said to his son Esau in Genesis chapter 27, quote, I know not the day of my death, nor do we have any certainty of when the end of the age will dawn, only that like our death, it is certain that it will come. Likewise, the author of Hebrews makes this plain, chapter 9, verse 27, saying, quote, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that, face judgment. So, in effect, you can swim, but you cannot hide. There is no escaping this kingdom of heaven that is like a net. Continuing with the net drawn to shore, we see that work immediately begins sorting the good, and the bad. Each fish is either worthy of consumption or it isn't. As a fisherman, I can very much appreciate this. On occasion, I've happened to catch some fish that don't look particularly healthy. Or more poignantly, I've cleaned fish, only discovered that they had diseased spots or were infested with worms. Now, I don't know about you, but for me and my household, these are uncomplicated decisions. Finding one spot or one worm yields the same judgment as finding dozens. I ain't going to eat it. Here, Jesus is communicating that these judgments will be decisive and definitive with no middle ground. Your judgment is just as certain as your death. Just in case there was still any doubt, or just in case someone happened to be thinking, well, what exactly does he mean by, quote, good and, quote, bad? Jesus doubles down by explaining the parable and what will be its future reality someday, saying, 
so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If this sounds like a stark contrast, it's because it is. It's the starkest of contrasts. There is no greater definitive, decisive contrast than we see here. Evil and righteousness are complete and total opposites. Now, when I first was contemplating this in my mind, my, I immediately went to thinking or picturing about these as polar opposites, which fundamentally they are, but Next, I realized that this implied that there might be a linear association between those polar opposites, as if they were two ends of a spectrum. But that is a quite wrong and human way of thinking about them. Actually, I find it ironic how humans judge good and bad, evil and righteousness. For all the world's supposed acceptance and open-mindedness, it is bewilderingly swift at passing judgment, quick to label anything and everything canceled these days. At least when it comes to placing others under the microscope, that is. But should one happen to find themselves under the microscope? Hmm. Well, let's just say it's amazing how easily the most judgmental person will turn that which is black and white into a spectrum of undistinguishable grays. It is naturally human to rationalize and justify our deeds as shades of gray. The problem, of course, is that is not at all how God views them, and it is He who is the judge. The measure is not to be just barely more righteous than evil, or even to be nearly entirely righteous, but not, not quite. It is to be righteous, completely righteous, perfect, blameless, without fault, and else, evil. There is no spectrum. It is binary. It is one or the other. I cannot stress enough what a terribly important point this is. Folks, this is the bad news. The bad news that makes the good news the good news. If there is one point I desperately desire that every person listening would know. It is this. The balance of your bad, your sin, and the balance of your good, your deeds, it is irrelevant in regards to your access to the kingdom of heaven. The litmus test is not how much good have you done. It is, have you done anything bad? And unless you are a liar or a lunatic, the answer is, of course, yes. Again, I must stress that this is so, so incredibly important to get right. I think it very well may be the most difficult hurdle for those of the world to overcome on their journey to understanding the gospel. Let's take a very dear, unbelieving friend of mine, as an example. Over the course of time, through many conversations, I've asked a variation of the following question to this friend. At the end of your days, standing before the creator of the universe, needing to give an account for your life, what do you say? Invariably, the response has consistently been a variation of the following from this friend. I know I'm not perfect, but I've tried to live a good life. 
hopefully the things I've done to really help people are enough to outweigh my wrongs. Recalling these conversations often wells up ample emotion. And I imagine that many of you know what I mean. Those of you that have had conversations like these with your dear friends. It's often difficult getting to those moments where you see that they're on the cusp. The opportunity to seize the good news of the gospel is right in front of them. And though you can see it, they can't. It's honestly agony to think about my friend's response. Because I see the humility. They're recognizing they know they're not perfect. And I know how attractive that is in God's eyes to set yourself rightly as opposed to the perfection of Him as Creator. They're so close in that moment. And yet in the next breath, referring to their works, they are so far away. And I get it. I mean, it's hard to imagine how our worldly judgments and distinctions can seemingly mean nothing in light of the gospel. I mean, after all, our entire justice system is predicated on the distinction of varying degrees of difference between good and bad and right and wrong. How is it that a murderer can be worthy of forgiveness in Christ? And meanwhile, by comparison, how can my tiny errors, my transgressions, indiscretions, how, how can they be worthy of condemnation? Of those two questions, for my friend, I think it is generally a variation of the former that is difficult. There are some very deep wounds and a lot of grudges. And it's hard to let go. But for others, I think it's often the latter. How can a just and perfect God hold an inherently imperfect being accountable for their imperfections? Why can't perfect God just let go, ignore, overlook my little imperfections? especially considering all my good intentions? How many of us have heard variations of these questions? How many of us have asked these questions? It's as if the world wants God to just, quote, manage sin. Package it up neatly and set it aside. The real irony, of course, is that is essentially uh, where God started. It's quite actually what God established in the Garden of Eden. God created not just the world, but the entire universe in all of its glory, and we in His likeness, and amidst all of this magnificent creation, which we don't even have the first slimmest grasp of outside of our planet, when we look at the universe as a whole, he took the knowledge of good and evil and he planted it in one little tree. And from the opportunity afforded by that one tree came the original sin. And from that one sin, one sin, thousands of years ago to where we stand today, we have all forms of idolatry, of vulgarness, adultery, envy, hate, murder, lies, theft, covetousness, you name it. In the thousands of years since the Ten Commandments were established, humanity has yet to master a single one. Not one. That. That is why God cannot just, 
quote, manage sin. That is why God cannot just sweep it under the rug or pretend that it doesn't exist. Because that is ultimately what undealt with sin brings to bear. And he will not have it in his kingdom. Once you come to accept the reality of that truth, only then can you realize that your sin incurs an infinite penalty of being thrown into the fiery furnace because it's a stain on what is otherwise infinitely perfect. What hope is there then? What hope would there be if but one sin destines me for eternal wrong or weeping and gnashing of teeth? And that, my friends, is where the good news enters in, that Jesus Christ lived an infinitely perfect life, and he made infinitely perfect sacrifice, that if you would give your life to him, accepting this through faith, then his infinitely perfect sacrifice will expunge your infinite penalty. And then, on that day, that day of judgment, when the wicked are thrown into the furnace, there you will be righteous before your Lord, your sin washed away by his blood. So in conclusion of this first parable, perhaps it is worth considering. Do you really believe Jesus when he says the evil will be separated from the righteous and thrown into the fire? Is God prompting you to believe this truth for your own salvation by accepting by faith the sacrifice of his son? Or as a believer, is God prompting you to believe this truth with a newfound urgency to share with others why their sin cannot just be ignored? For those of you God is stirring, will you respond? How? So now we come to this final parable of chapter 13. Why is it that Jesus seems to insert this seemingly out-of-place point about new and old treasures here? Verse 51, Jesus asked the disciples a question. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. Now, again here, we lack sufficient context, but I would surely love to know the nature of this response from the disciples. I mean, was this a enthusiastic, like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, we got it? Or was this like a, uh, I, think, I think so, may, maybe, yeah, yeah, I get it? Because by this point, as many times as they've needed clarity about Jesus' teachings, you think that they'd be a little wary, now wondering what maybe they missed up to this point. Equally, I'd love to have insight into Jesus' mind here, because if I didn't know any better, it's as if he's setting them up to assert that they are keeping up to this point, only to move the goal fo- goalpost further ahead by giving them something more profound to think and chew on. Sounds like Jesus, something he might do. Verse 52, then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. To understand what Jesus is getting at here, it is helpful to revisit the broader context. If we look back just before this to chapter 12, we'll see that there has been an increasing strain a growing tension between Jesus and the Pharisees, including no less than five direct conflicts in the preceding chapter 12. A tension that continues to build and ultimately culminates with Jesus' crucifixion. It's 
not hard to imagine that this precedent of tension between Jesus and the teachers of the Old Testament could easily have led to a us, the disciples of the new, versus them, the teachers of the old. And worse, an insinuation that the old, the law, had become obsolete, irrelevant, or no longer useful. Here, Jesus seems to be affirming again what he stated earlier in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where he said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In this parable, he helps the disciples better understand that tension by foreshadowing the special role that they and future newcomers like the Apostle Paul would play as scribes. Now here, the term scribe refers to specifically the skill of writing and teaching, a particularly important and useful skill pertaining to Jewish law. And he's not referring to here as to the groups of scribes or the groups of Pharisees. As there were a group of scribes that did possess this skill, here he's not referring to them, but he's referring specifically to the skill of scribe. Scribes of Jewish law had a rarefied gift that they could write. And they needed, in order to perform their task well, a thorough and intimate understanding of Old Testament texts. Layering atop of that truth, Jesus applies the skill of scribe to them, his disciples, in the context of having been, quote, trained for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus challenges his disciples then and now to apply themselves to the teachings of the old and new, to treat them like treasures and then harmoniously bring them forth to be shared as sustenance for all who would belong to the kingdom of heaven, much like the master of a house would bring forth his treasures, his stored goods, his provisions to be shared with those under his care. So consider then as we wrap up this parable and conclude our time, is God prompting you to better invest your time in his word, to know its treasures, new and old? Is God laying someone on your heart whom you could share those treasures with? And for those of you that God is stirring, will you respond? How? Let's pray. Lord, your your word It is truly living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting straight and true to our most vital members, most vital vestiges. Who else is like you, God, that commands cosmic power while able to know the innermost fears of mere men, of mere mortals? We acknowledge, Lord, that apart from you, we can do nothing in light of those fears. But thanks be to you. By your strength, all fear is lost and all hope is found. Death, where is your sting? Jesus, please help help us to live with such boldness that we would rise to your call and your stirring of our hearts to courageously go out into the world and lovingly share the truth and the good news of you, the resurrected 